Will the congregation please stand as we read the gospel lesson? After he said this, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who are sent departed and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying this colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had been seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Please be seated.
grace to the Lord Almighty. Good morning, Zion. Good morning. Welcome to this celebration Sunday that is Palm Sunday, where we as a community and with the church at large celebrate the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ, both into the city of Jerusalem and into our story. This is the start of a very busy week. It is Holy Week. Uh, and we have a number of opportunities to worship together and be in community with Christ together. Uh, starting today, uh, we have a First Communion class here at, at Zion. It is going to start at 1 p.m. If you have not registered and wish to be part of the First Communion class, there is still time. And truly, just show up. We have plenty of, plenty of opportunities for everybody. If you'd like to be part of that First Communion class, please join us. Um, Monday, Thursday... We are going to have services at both 1.30 and 7, uh, celebrating the Last Supper. And then we will also be having our Good Friday service here at Zion at 7 p.m. on Friday. Which leads us to the main event. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. We are going to have sunrise service at 7. That's right. 7 o'clock. The sun is up by then, so come on down. 7 o'clock. And then shortly after that, at 8 o'clock, we will have a light breakfast of cinnamon rolls and fruit and fellowship and definitely coffee and juice. And I'm a, I heard water. We're having water as well. It's an exciting time. 8 o'clock. Uh, so come early if you want to come for that. Um, if you're going to be, I guess there's a 7 o'clock and a 9 o'clock. So come early if you're coming to the, seven, or the 9 o'clock. Stay late if you've come for the 7 o'clock service. It's a good time. We would love to be in community in Christ together. That is all the announcements I have for today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have established your rule in the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your Spirit, keep us in joyful procession of those who with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord, and with their lives Praise him as Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We read respons responsibly from Psalm 118. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The reading today comes from Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As, you, as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent Jodah as my bow I have uh, made Ephraim its arrow I will rouse your sons O Zion against your sons O Greece and weld you like a warrior sword the word of the Lord
Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 19th chapter. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground and you, your children, within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit among us today. Help us lift up praise and joy at your triumphal entry into the city and into our hearts and into our lives. Please shield these individuals from what is my opinion and only reveal what is your heavenly glory. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What a fun day. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard pastors up here saying there's only a couple of Sundays that are just really interesting and really fun to see and look out over the crowd. And one of them is Ash Wednesday, but one of them is Palm Sunday, and I never experienced that until today. Uh, and all of the waving branches, it is exciting. It was fun. Um, being able to be part of a process like that, what did, I, what did Leslie call it? She called it a cacophony of noise, I think it was called. <laughs> random shouts, random waving. Uh, it's fun to see. It's fun to be a part of. Uh, this morning, I want to take you back to a Palm Sunday many years ago to my youth, uh, where the children of my home church processed in kind of like this, with a cacophony of noise. We had somebody carrying bongo drums, and our pastor told us to shout Hosanna at the top of our lungs, and we had palm branches, and of course, the tambourine. Now, you may have guessed this about me already, uh, but I was a spirited youth. Uh, I enjoyed a ruckus, as it were. Uh, I didn't mind getting in front of people. I've never had a problem with that, actually. So when the pastor looked out over the gaggle of kids, right, all of these kids, he locked eyes with 11-year-old me, right? And he nodded his head and said, you know what to do. <laughs> and I knew what he meant. I understood the assignment. And I was going to lead the processional. I was the first one through the gate. Like I was the head cacophony maker. And I was ready right up until I stepped foot inside the sanctuary. And I got in the way of myself. We had a bunch of kids behind me. The church was full. And we were just about to raise up praise to God, right? And I kept thinking about how exposed I was, how vulnerable I was to be out there in the front. And I had seen one of my classmates look at me when I got handed the tambourine, and I, I saw the condescending looks, and I thought, what if I'm the only joker up there making noise? Right? What if I went all in and I was the only one? And all I could think about was what the other people were thinking about. Like, why did I want the tambourine? Like, I don't even know how to play the tambourine. Does anybody know how to actually play the tambourine? Like, how, it's such an impractical instrument. Like, how do you even tune this thing? Can you tune it? What if I play it wrong? What if they think that I'm stupid? Or what if they make fun of me? What if, what if, what if? And so this event that we are commemorating today, what Luke calls the triumphal entry for 11-year-old me, kind of looked like this. Afterward, my dad, he came up to me and he's like, what was that? That wasn't joyful or triumphant. And now I'm embarrassed all over again, right? And I do what everybody does when they get embarrassed about something. Uh, I minimized it and I tried to brush it aside, but I didn't want to do it anyway. You know, I, just, I mean, we're still in the season of Lent, right? Aren't we supposed to be sad and remember that we're going to die someday? Isn't that what Lent's all about? 
He goes, well, I guess, but not today. Like today we remember that Jesus is king, that he has entered into our city humbly, the servant leader, that Jesus is the hero in our story, the story of us. But let me ask you this question. Have you ever heard of a story where the hero dies for the villain? That's right. Have you ever heard a story where the hero dies for the villain? Because I, I couldn't really find one. I couldn't find one except for Jesus. Now, I've read plenty of books, and I've seen movies where the hero sacrifices something, maybe sacrifices themselves for the undeserving villain. But lay down, their, lay down their life to an undeserving villain? No. By design, the season of Lent, it was a bit heavy. And I promise you it won't be like that forever. It won't be the case forever. But it was necessary for Lent. Lent gives us permission to sit with the uncomfortable nature of our own sins. It allows us space to recognize where our lives are in relation to God so that we can repent and be saved. To open our eyes to who the villain is in this story. In this Palm Sunday narrative, who's the villain? And as much as I'd like to say that it was the Pharisees or maybe the Romans, it doesn't take much to realize that the true villain in this story was the crowd. It's us. Which is why our ongoing theme of mercy is so crucial for us in this season of Lent. In our midweek Lenten services, we dove deep into the book of Jonah. And that got a bit heavy at times. I mean, God kept throwing mercy and compassion and forgiveness at Jonah, and at every turn, he kept missing the point. And here on Sundays, when we walked through the book of Nehemiah, in our sermon series called I Need, we explored the five needs that we tell ourselves that are the most important things in our life. That if we were to get richer, or if we were to be surrounded by the love of this world, or to do well and be perfect. If we were to only get better, then maybe we could get happier and our lives would be forever better. But like I said, it was intentionally heavy. But it all leads to this. The entire season of Lent leads up to this moment, Holy Week. It's the last week of Jesus' life. It's detailed in 29 chapters throughout the 89 chapters of the gospel lesson. Like a full third of Matthew and Mark, a quarter of Luke, almost half of the book of John talks about the last week of Jesus' life. It's that important. So I want you to imagine for a second. Imagine being there that day. The noise that must have happened that day. Bodies pressed in around you. The dust is stirring up. People are craning their necks just to catch a glimpse of him. All the Gospels, except for Luke, record that the people were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! Which is a, a shout of joy and praise. But it also means, save us. Save us now, in the original Hebrew. People are lining the streets. They're tearing off branches from palm trees and they're taking their cloaks off and laying out a makeshift red carpet for Jesus. Here comes our king. Save us. Now, what I find interesting uh, about this scene is just how out of character this is for Jesus. This is a complete departure from his norm. Like This is the same God who each and every time he worked a miracle in somebody's life, he says, look, just don't go and tell anybody about this. Okay? This is the same God that anybody, that any time anybody says, you are the Son of God, the Messiah. Jesus says, yes, that's true. God has revealed that to you, 
but let's just keep that between us for now. It's the same God who, when the crowd got the biggest, just after the feeding of the 5,000, he chooses a particularly hard teaching, intentionally disorienting the crowd, proving he's not interested in numbers, he's interested in commitment. And most of them walk away from him. And he lets them go. So why allow this spectacle at all? What exactly is going on here? And I think the key that unlocks the meaning of what Jesus is doing here is found at the very end of our gospel lesson today, beginning at verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, only you, even you, had only known that this day this day your king comes. On this day, what this meant. But now it's hidden from you. So why? Why this emotional roller coaster? Why in the middle of a parade in your honor do you stop and weep? It's because Jesus knows that the praise of the people chanting Hosanna is fleeting. It's temporary. See, the very same people who are tearing branches off of trees and throwing their cloaks on the ground will line the very same streets in five days. And instead, instead of calling out Hosanna, <coughs> they're going to scream, crucify him. Crucify him. Jesus is painfully aware of this. And so as he comes into view of the skyline of Jerusalem, he stops and allows himself to bear the full weight of the moment. He allows himself to bear the weight of how things should be versus how things are. See, 11-year-old Isaiah should have led that processional with excitement, with joy. The king has arrived. Our hero has come to save us. Shout Hosanna. Blessed is he. But I let myself get in the way. If I had only placed myself on those streets that day. But I let me sabotage myself. Instead of playing the tambourine as it should be played, there's only one way to play this thing. And it is loud, right? To be filled with Jesus, there is only one response that makes sense, and that is a triumphal shout of joy. But I think for a moment, at least a moment, we also need, this is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> at least for a moment, we need to do one thing. We also need to join Jesus sitting on the colt, weeping over the distance that has grown between how he intended things to be and how things actually are. Like when you hear Palm Sunday, what do you think of? Is it just the waving of the palms and the shouts? Or is it more? See, most of us hear Palm Sunday and we say, I know, I know why Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He's coming to die for our sins on the cross. And he is. But that is a minimization of what is actually happening. I mean, it's not a small thing, but it is a minimization. Because Jesus didn't pay the ultimate sacrifice so that he could create a group of disconnected individuals that would someday meet up in heaven. Both Luke and John record for us Jesus' vision of a community of people, a new community of people that are interconnected as a body is interconnected, the likes of which the world has never seen, who won't allow themselves to get in the way, who focus less on self and more on Christ and his vision for us. That is what we get to do today. And so I invite you today, I invite you to sit with Jesus, looking at the skyline and weeping 
over the distance that we have created with us and God. A distance created by those same five needs that we've told ourselves that we need in order to have a life that we've always wanted. They are the things that we have allowed to get in our way, to silence our joy for Christ. Each one of those needs focuses on self. It pushes open this canyon between us and God. We can feel it. It's uncomfortable. And so we keep trying to fill it, but we fill it with self. We fill it with the things of this world, with sin. It will drive us to line the very same streets in Jerusalem in one week. And it exposes our need for a savior. We don't need the riches of the world or reputation. I don't need shallow community with people who are in it for the moment and discard it when it suits my plans or desires. <coughs> Have you ever heard of a story where the villain dies for the hero? Let me rephrase that. Have you ever heard of a story where the hero dies for the villain? See, I'm the villain in this story. And Jesus came for me anyway. And so I will lift my palms in praise to the one who comes humbly on a colt. I will lay down my cloak for the one who sacrifices everything for a wretch like me. I have been baptized and set free. I will be unapologetically triumphant with my praise to God. I will be part of any cacophony of noise. I will play my, tra tra my tambourine for, for nobody but Jesus, lifting my song to my Savior, loud and strong. And I will cry Hosanna for all to hear, lest the very stones at my feet cry out for me. Yeah, I don't need more of me. I need Jesus. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Will you please stand and join with me as we sing Baptized and Set Free.
God, who is rich in mercy and love, give us new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Christ. We are united with all the baptized into the one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Mallory and Mitchell, called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace of God, do you desire to have your child baptized into Christ? As you bring Morgan to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibility to live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the word of God, to the Holy Supper, teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, and nourish her in faith and prayer so that she may learn to trust God, to proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Morgan grow in the Christian faith and life? Sponsors, Blake and Ellie, do you promise to nurture Morgan in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's spirit and to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in the communion of the church. People of God, do you promise to support Morgan and pray for her in her new life in Christ? We do. I ask you to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of this world that rebel against God, and the ways of sin that draw you from God? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the earth. On the third day he rose again. believe in God, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The assembly may be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O oh God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters. And by your word you created the world, calling forth in which you have took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Morgan Ryan Meyer, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. We give thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you gave your daughter new birth. Cleanse her from her sins and raise her into eternal life. 
Sustain Morgan with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Morgan, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now my favorite part. Let us welcome the newly baptized into the cross of Christ. Yep, praise God. As we share the peace today, I ask that you remain standing as the offering plates are brought forward. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share that peace with your neighbor. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we pray for the church, called to follow Jesus in the way of the cross. Make us unflinching servants of the gospel. Deliver us from hardship as we confront the forces of injustice. Merciful God. For all the earth created in love, train us to recognize your divine goodness in the world around us. Rouse in us a reverence for creation, that we may take greater care of your glory. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who suffer, waiting expectantly for mercy and consolation. Accompany those who feel abandoned. Defend those who are wrongly accused and embrace those who are incarcerated or detained. Especially we pray for healing for Roy, Ellen, Carrie, Lois, Robert, Betty, and the family of Connie and Ron Sabo. Merciful God. 
for Christians around the world preparing this week to journey with Christ to the cross, reveal to us again the unshakable power of humble service, unmerited forgiveness, and sacrificial love. Merciful God, Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need. For the sake of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please receive the blessing. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Join with me in our final hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way.